Hey everybody, Josh Bentley, Developer Advocate with the SAP Developer Relations Team. Today we're going to present to you some more on the Kima topic for Devtoberfest. With me is Jamie Cauley. If you could introduce yourself, Jamie. Thank you, Josh. And as you mentioned, my name is Jamie Cauley and I'm part of the product management team for the SAP Cloud Platform Kima Runtime. And in today's session, Josh at first is going to give you a, a recap. So you want to, you want to start with that, Josh? Yeah, for sure. So this session is going to be about an hour to an hour and a half long, and we're going to go through a lot of topics that are uh, covered by Jamie in the end. But in the beginning, I just wanted to real quick reiterate what we've covered this week in Devtoberfest for the Kima subject. We've gone through and, of course, told you what Kima was and educated you on how to build your own Kima and install that locally and run on your own machine and install things like the kubectl for the first time and maybe getting your first Docker set up with your first containerized application. Then we went into talking about how are you going to do this on a hyperscaler? And I introduced you to another open source project from SAP, Project Gardener. And we'll mention that a little bit later in some of our demos today. So after learning about how to do a Kima local and Kima on a hypervisor, now we've gone to the actual level of what am I going to do with applications? And we built some applications, we built our Kima, and we deployed applications to it, and we added things like OAuth, and put a load against that and increased what our actual Kima clusters were having to manage. So a lot of details have been covered in this previous sessions. We've already uh, been through four days of Kima enablement and now that we're at the end of the week, we wanted Jamie to come back and actually touch on not so much the open source standalone versions that the open source community builds, but what SAP is doing from a product management side to actually make SAP a place where you can go to the cloud platform and use the Kima runtime. So Jamie's going to go through what those actual components are in about four or five slides, and then he'll get into detail with some demos. Thanks, Josh. So yeah, as Josh mentioned, we're just going to do a brief overview of how uh, Kima fits into the cloud platform, and then we're going to go right into uh, uh, building a scenario, which we'll uh, detail in a few slides. So just starting off with the cloud platform in general, we kind of uh, break it up into two uh, suite layers here. We have the extension suite, which is what we're going to focus on today. And then we also have an integration suite. So the integration suite is really comprising of just uh, moving data between SAP systems and uh, non-SAP systems. So there's a bunch of uh, services that are uh, related to that, such as cloud platform integration or like a API uh, management. But as I said, we're going to focus on extension suite. So you know, let's move ahead quickly so we can get into the scenario. So when we look at the extension suite, so there's a whole bunch of uh, different components that relate to this. Uh, as I mentioned, we're really just focusing on what's related to Kima. So in the first one being is the central management plane. And this is the area in the cloud platform, which is where you would connect your uh, systems that exist in your intelligent enterprise, such as uh, your SAP systems, as well as third party systems. So there's no, uh, we're not strictly only SAP, we're, we're opening this up to third party as well. Okay. And what the central management plane does is really centralize your connections for, into these systems so that you have a centralized place, place to manage them. And basically what the, that process is, is there's a pairing that takes place and we're gonna, you know, gonna go through this in a demo. So a, a pairing takes place to uh, provide a secure connectivity between this the cloud platform and those uh, other cloud systems. And once that pairing, uh, the first part of that pairing is uh, completed, then these systems then publish information in regards to the, the APIs or events that they may expose. And with that, you can then push them into uh, runtimes to utilize that information. And that, that's the second part of what we're really focusing on when we look at this extension suite. So the you know, I highlight is this next piece is development efficiency. So that really comprises the three different uh, areas here. So we're starting with like tools, different uh, tools that we have available to make uh, development easier, such as uh, the Cloud Platform SDK. And we also have different uh, programming models, uh, which is, you know, there's, uh, what is it, RAP and uh, CAP. CAP, yep. Cloud Application Program Model actually is something that has been talked about in a previous Devtoberfest week of enablement. So most of the people that were interested in that saw it. And if uh, people are crossing over into this topic, they can actually learn about how to actually combine CAP and Kima because there's a lot yeah, of stuff coming Yeah, there's a session down. coming up on that too, right? With uh, the Devtoberfest, CAP and Kima, right? Yep, exactly. So you can visit that one for that one. 
uh, or for that information. And then finally, we have runtime. So there's various different runtimes. We have a, a serverless runtime. We have a Cloud Foundry uh, runtime and uh, an ABAP runtime. But as I mentioned, we're going to focus just on Kima. So what is Kima in this context? So you know, this is just a real basic architecture slide to kind of like indicate the components that are available there. And as we mentioned that this uh, Kima is sitting on Kubernetes. So we use Kubernetes and we use the uh, open source project Gardner to actually provision these uh, clusters. So Gardner is basically using uh, Kubernetes to install Kubernetes. So that's all behind the scenes, nothing that as a customer you would see. So once you have your Kima runtime available, we're gonna start at the left-hand side at this application connector. So this is the component inside the Kima runtime that would talk to the central management plane to obtain the information in regards to any of these uh, systems that you connected through the central management plane. So information regarding the APIs and events, and it's gonna handle things like authenticating back to those systems for us and managing the events that uh, those systems then publish into uh, the Kima runtime here. Okay. Next, we're gonna talk real quickly about the micro gateway. So that's how you would expose any of your uh, services that you're running inside of your uh, Kima cluster to expose them to the, the outside world, to the internet. And with that, you have a, the various different options. I believe one of your exercises, you do this. So you yes. uh, use, yep. use uh, an OAuth method to authenticate it. Exactly. We had a guest, Daniel uh, Severo, who came in and showed us how to do that in one of his exercises. And uh, I think that was exercise three, if people are looking at three or four. Great. And we also have options to uh, secure them with a, in like an identity provider. So you can use that JWT to do that as well. And you can, you know, there's pathing options. So you can have different authentication methods on paths. You can manage what HTTP methods are allowed. So there's various different options with the micro gateway. And then we'll look at service catalog. So the service catalog is what uh, provides us access to then utilize uh, these pieces that we connect to our, to our runtime. So if we have an application connected through the application connector that shows up in the service ca catalog showing us all the different APIs and events that that system has, and that's how we can create instances of these and then utilize them in uh, a microservice or a, a, a function, a Lambda function. In addition to that, we can also provision instances of services that are existing on SAP Cloud Platform, as well as uh, services that exist on the third party uh, providers, such as Azure, Google Cloud, or AWS. Okay. So many, many different options there for how to consume external services into your, your Kima runtime. Next, we have uh, functions. So this is our serverless runtime that we have inside of Kima. So that is uh, built using the open source component uh, Knative. And we also have, you know, obviously we can do uh, microservices and that's all based on Docker. And with that, we use Istio to uh, basically manage our service mesh to give us the ability to do different things like routing differently and uh, you know, basically managing the uh, communication between all the services to make sure it's done in a secure manner. And we also have, uh, uh, for observability, we have uh, the logging feature provided by Loki. So this is Kubernetes. So it uses uh, labels to organize uh, all the resources that we have in there. So you know, there's all different ways to organize that. It's kind of up to you how you want to okay. do that. But it just basically uses labels to, to look at logs by uh, querying for them based on the label that you assign to whatever resource that you uh, added into the system. And finally, we have eventing. So currently we're running the Kima runtime on Azure. That's the first uh, provider that we have provided for this. And that is using uh, Azure event hubs. And that works in conjunction with another Knative piece there that you see that little symbol there. Okay. Sound good? Sounds good. I have a question. I think the next slide sure. I'll ask it though. I wanna make sure I don't jump ahead. 
So yeah, okay. once you're done with this slide, I want to do a little bit of a deeper dive into what the differences are with SAP's cloud platform version versus open source. Yeah, so this is exactly where we're at on this slide. So the, the differences of the Kima open source runtime versus the, the SAP cloud platform Kima runtime. So, so, will this, so this slide, does it spell out that SAP is using the exact same version that's in the open source community and that other people are contributing to it? Not necessarily, but that, that okay. is definitely the case. So it's definitely the, the, the version that you would uh, utilize through the open source site is exactly what we're, what we're doing. But we are, we're using our own Microsoft Azure uh, subscription to install that and then giving you access to it. So you can see that the, you know, on the infrastructure that that hyperscaler subscription is from SAP. So there's no access okay. by a customer into that. Of course, if you install this yourself, which you, you know, you can do, you would have full access into that cluster. Okay. And with that, you know, so going more back to the SAP stuff, so you're getting it from SAP. So we're going to provide you with a uh, uh, operation and support side on SAP. And this is based on the, the, cloud platform enterprise agreement. So with that, you get all the Kima uh, components are covered by that support agreement. And anything as, as a customer would build would be the customer's responsibility. Okay. There's, there's a few different differences of what, you know, depending on what your needs are, if you want to really manage the, the cluster yourself, then you would want to use just open source version and install that and manage that yourself on whatever provider. But if you want to have somebody else managing it for you, that's where this, the, the managed uh, Kima runtime comes in by the, the SAP cloud platform. If someone plays with Kima and they deploy some applications like they did in our exercises this week, can they take those Kima deployments and move them over to the SAP managed system or do they have to start over? Yeah, anything that you're doing in your na it's namespaces. So in the managed uh, offering, uh, what we're doing is managing your Kubernetes cluster for you. So we're updating that Kubernetes cluster. We're uh, putting security patches on it. The same thing holds true with the Kima, uh, the Kima components. We're updating them and making sure that they're all up to date with any type of security patches that are available. So we kind of lock that down so you cannot uh, access it. And so all of your work is in your own namespaces. So you have full access to your own namespaces, but not so much these uh, system ones. Okay. Whereas the open source one, you 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 can go in and break your cluster if you wanted to. Nice. For a okay. Good. Cool. Very cool. What's the next okay. slide? So that's our quick overview. So now we want to get into our little uh, sample application that we're going to build. So what I'm going to show you today is available. I'll show you where it's available on uh, a Git repository. Uh, uh, Coming soon, this will all be published into the SAP Community's tutorial navigator. So you'll have all these steps uh, documented in there, which you can go through the different tutorials to do it. It's up to you. But so I'm gonna just give you a little idea of how that all works and comes, comes together uh, today. So okay. we have uh, uh, six different steps that we're gonna go through. So we're gonna, you can see with step one, we're gonna deploy this mock application. And we're gonna use the mock application so we're not restricting this scenario to anybody. So and you could use, if you have a, a commerce cloud in production, like a real one, you could do the same exact thing with this, but just for us, uh, simplicity's sake, we're gonna use the, the mock one here. So we're gonna deploy that into our, our Kima runtime. And then we're gonna connect it through the central management plane back into the uh, Kima runtime. So it's just, as I said, it's just a mock. So. The same holds true if you wanted to do it with a production system or you know a real commerce cloud system. And then once that is complete, we're gonna then deploy a database into our cluster. So we're gonna do that in this scenario, we're gonna do it in their cluster. So I, I mentioned at the top of the slide that this is a, a dev setup. So if you wanted to do this in production, you would probably wanna push that uh, database to a, a provider. So there is a, a in the repo that we're going to reference, there is a scenario that shows you how to do that with Microsoft Azure using the open service broker to provision a database on that provider and then consume that into your Kima runtime. Okay. But, but as I said, we're going to do it in the cluster just for simplicity. Mm -hmm. And then step four, we're going to 
expose that uh, database with a Golang API. And that API will read that and provide information to our front end that we have in step five that is uh, written in UI5. You also okay. find in the repo that there is one for uh, React.js as well. And then uh, step six, finally, we will create an event trigger, which then can consume information from a mock application into our database through our Golang API. Okay. Is that clear? Like a lot to cover. It's very clear. And uh, I think as we go through these, you'll just mention when you're moving through the steps. So if people come back and follow along with the GitHub repository, they'll know how to exactly copy this flow. Exactly. So let me, uh, let me move some screens around. Okay. And I think maybe one thing we should start off with too, did you, in your session, did you cover using the, the trial? I mentioned that the, in, in the cloud platform trial now that you can provision Kima clusters. We did not. That's a great point. So we recorded videos that showed people how to deploy locally. And in the hyperscaler version, I referenced using Gardner so that mm -hmm. you could deploy from, you know, any hyperscaler you wanted. But I purposely avoided doing the trial systems because I wasn't sure the status of publicly during Devtoberfest if we uh, were ready to announce that. So it's really on the table for you now. Yeah, so, okay, great. So um, this is my trial account. So I just wanted to bring this up quickly before we go into, I already have a cluster set up, but I just wanted to, you know, I just want to mention this. So you are aware that this is a, a, a way that you can then you utilize uh, Kima. So this works in the same exact uh, way that you would do it on a, a cloud platform uh, production account. So I'm already logged into my trial. I have one trial sub account. I'm going to create a new one. And I should have refreshed my browser. So let me, uh, let me do that real quick. If you're new to the SAP community and tools, then you need to refresh often. If you're not new to the <laughs> SAP community, you're used to doing this, but it saves your user ID and password during the session. If you're using single sign on, especially. So I'm just going to create a cluster or I'm, I'm sorry, create a sub account in the U S region. And this takes about a, 20 seconds, so I'm gonna grab a drink while we wait. <laughs> and there we go. So we now, now we have our sub account. So I'm gonna go into our sub account. And what you wanna do in here is come into entitlements. And you're going to click uh, configured entitlements and search for, I'm sorry, you got to click add service plan. Okay. And search for Kima. And you have the one option trial. I'm going to add that one service plan and save my changes. So now if I come back to the overview, I have this option to enable Kima. If I click on that, I just provide a name and hit create. And that's going to go, uh, go ahead and kick off that process to provision a Kubernetes cluster and then install Kima on top of it, right? Okay. So that's, well, am I going to do that now? I already have a cluster set up. So let me go back to that. I may have to refresh these pages as well, but. Yeah, so I have them set up. So before we get into the demo, the, uh, I just want to make aware of a couple things. So as I said, this will be on the tutorial navigator very soon. Uh, today, it's not there when we're, we're doing this video, but what, what basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I have these mock applications. So I have a blog, a blog published about this, which provides me the steps. So I'm just going to use this. So this is made available. So we can put this link in the, in the video description. Definitely. And we also have this uh, GitHub repository and in the SAP samples, you'll find this Kima runtime extension samples. And we're gonna reference all this stuff here. So you can see there's a whole bunch of different examples here. We're gonna just be focusing on three of them. You can see there's just some basic information and we have uh, a catalog or index of each one. You click on uh, 
one of the index takes you to a, a readme specific to that example, it tells you how to set it up, your prereqs, you know, different, different scenarios. So like run it on a cluster, running it locally. So a whole bunch of different things. So we're going to walk through this uh, today and try to get a understanding of how to set it up by doing so, right? Awesome. Okay. So the first step is that step three, I think, doing the database. So step one is going to be the mock though. Yeah. So we're going to start, start with the mock. So we have those links. We're going to provide you the links. Uh, let me refresh this. I'm just going to close this guy. So the first thing I mentioned, I already have a, a cluster provision. So the first thing I want to do is go and open that cluster. So I have this demo US. US one, mm, US one. one. So this is what your Kima environment will look like after you provision it. And you'll just have a link. And I'm going to open this link. And one thing also to consider when you provision, there's uh, two roles that you will need to access this. So I'll show you how I have it set up. So I have uh, role collections and I have this Kima role and there's two roles in it. So this uh, Kima runtime name, uh, namespace admin and the developer. So you wanna okay. make sure to create a role collection, put those two roles in it and then add your user to that role collection. So you can either add your user in this screen and you could, or you could also go into trust configuration, click on your IDP, uh, type your email address in. Hopefully you can type better than me <laughs> and assign yourself to that, that role collection that you made. Okay. Okay. So I already opened up Kima. So you can see there's nothing in here right now. So the first thing I'm going to do is download the cube config. So what the cube config does is give us access uh, into our cluster using the command line tool, uh, kubectl or kubectl, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I think people set so, that up when they did their local deployments earlier. Yeah, so I can just, so I'm at, now I'm in uh, VS code. So I already have that, that run, that GitHub repository. I already have that locally on my machine. So okay. These are all the same folders that you saw when we were looking at the, the repo on the browser. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is set my cube config to this file. And with that, we can just check uh, to make sure that it, it worked. So we can do get, get context. So you can see here, this is the cluster. So this uh, 919 and uh, 911919. And just to point out, I have a, an alias here. So sometimes I type K for kubectl. So the, the command, if you don't have the alias, is you're going to type out that uh, kubectl all the way. So I just, okay. just for sake of uh, typing a few less characters. And so, so we have that set up. We have the uh, kubectl set up. We have our access into our cluster. So the first thing we're going to do is set up these mocks, right? So it wants us to apply these into a, a, a namespace called Mox. Okay. So I can create a namespace here by clicking the add namespace. I can also do it in a command line. So if I just do. Okay. So instead of creating the mock in the uh, graphical interface, you're creating it in the command line. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'll create my uh, namespace Mox. And so this is going to show up here as well. So as I said, we could have done it from here, but I just wanted to show you different options. And so now if we go back to this blog, uh, so we already did the cube config. We created this uh, mocks namespace we didn't have yet. And you know, obviously you could put this uh, deployment anywhere you want. But I'm going to copy this uh, path and paste it into my command line. And we're going to see that it created uh, three different items here. So a deployment, a service, and a per, uh, persistent volume claim. And I'm also going to apply this. And this one's going to expose this through an uh, API rule. So let's go back in here. So we'll see if we come in the mock. 
Okay. I see some stuff going on. Uh, so you see our uh, deployment for commerce mocks. So right now it's in an error state. So it's uh, loading up. So we come into the pod. That's okay. waiting. So then we hover over. We can see the pod is initializing. Same thing we see in there. We can do. Uh, uh, look at the pods in that namespace. You see the pods initializing. Okay. If I want to look at logs, I could do. And it's going to ask me to specify a container. So when I deploy something, so we have Istio set up. So every, any time you deploy something, it's going to also deploy, deploy another uh, container into your pod. Okay. And that is part of the Istio service mesh setup. Uh, you can turn it off if you want it to if for some reason. But hmm. you know, the default setup is that it's done that way. So you can see here, I just get two outputs. Uh, so it's running that app here. So I can see the same uh, information here as well. So this one combines both uh, containers. So this is uh, this output is from uh, refreshed. So the output down here is related to uh, the Istio component, that sidecar that it injects. And then it, you're going to see here, it's starting to set up uh, the, the commerce mock-up application. So, you know, if I do the same thing here, I'm going to start seeing additional output as okay. well. Yeah, I'll move this window a little bit. So this will take a moment to uh, set up. So while that is happening, we're going to move back to our uh, uh, cloud platform cockpit, and we're going to go to our global account level, which in my case, it's called Kima integration. And within there, you'll find uh, an option for system landscape and you'll okay. find systems and formations. So this is going back to our slides when we were talking about the central management plane. This is uh, what that, how you, how you see that in, the, in terms of the, the UI. So I'm going to click on the option to register my system. I'll call it Tabercom. Okay. And I'm going to set it to a commerce cloud. I'm going to click register. And you see, I get a token. So I'm going to copy this token. I'm going to need this in uh, one of the next steps. So I'm going to copy that and close. And now what I'm going to do is pair that system to my uh, runtime by creating a formation. So I can just call this uh, Deptober demo. I'll just call it Deptober. And I'm going to use the demo US uh, one sub account. Okay. And then I'm going to find my system in here. Just Deptober.com. You can see I could put multiple in there if I wanted to. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to click create. So now that is going to pair that system to my, my Kima runtime. So now Got if it. I come back to my Kima runtime and I choose this application systems, you can see here that this, uh, this is the system that I created. It prefixes it with a MP, I guess for a management plane. Okay. And so this is in process of setting this up. So what it does is it's going to kick off, uh, a generation of a couple pods that handle the communication of that system. So basically uh, they handle things like the authentication. So in Kima, you don't have to worry about uh, doing the authentication into one of these systems that's uh, handled through uh, in that process of when the API spec is presented to the man uh, management plane and then that prevents it to uh, present, uh, prevents it, presents it to Kima. It's going to generate uh basically the way to authenticate it for you. So you don't have to worry about it. So it's going to handle mm -hmm. like OAuth authentication or like a client certificate authentication. That's brilliant. So, so this is going to do that. So now what I got to do, so I have that token copied and let me just show this. So, so again, I went in system landscape, created the system and then put the formation. So that then shows up in here. So, I have that ready. In my mocks namespace, I have a, 
uh, an API role because that's one of the resources that I deployed. Okay. So if I click click on that now, it's going to open up the uh, mock application for me. And I have this connect option, which I can paste this token into, uh, which will then do the pairing for me. So I'm going to go ahead and click uh, connect. And this is going to take uh, a minute. So what it does is it, and you can see now that it's connected to this cluster, list out, uh, connect it. Okay. If I come back here, you can see that's now serving. Nice. Uh, we notice here there's <coughs> nothing. All we see is namespace bindings. So now that it's ready, I have this register all. And what this is going to do, it's just going to go through all these different APIs and basically register their specification into uh, first into the central management plane, but then into the Kima runtime. Okay. So you see there's a whole bunch of them. So this will take a minute. So we could see, uh, you kind of watch that process if you wanted to, by coming back into your... Uh, pod and looking at the logs. So you'll see some stuff going on here if you want to watch that. Or you know, you could also look at your uh, command line if you wanted to. But we're going to move on to the next step while that while that takes place. Okay. So as we mentioned earlier, I have the uh, the Kima runtime samples in my uh, VS code. So just to reiterate what I see here is the same thing that you're going to see in here. So it's just, I clone the, the, the repo and I have it down here. Okay. So I'm going to just clear this out. And the first thing I'm going to do is set up the, uh, the database. So maybe we should, uh, we did a couple things. So just to review what we're doing again. So we set up this commerce mock. So we deployed the mock application and then we connected it. So we have that done. So now we're gonna deploy the database in our cluster. All right. right. Okay, so I'm gonna change the directory that I'm in. So this stuff is existing, step three is existing in this database MS SQL. And as I mentioned, these all, all each, Sample itself has a, a README, so you can see in here, this provides you some uh, information. So it kind of tells you how this is set up, so you can kind of read uh, the setup here and uh, look at different ways to, to utilize it. So deploying the database into our cluster, which is what we're gonna do, and you also have an option to use the uh, Docker image to run it locally if you wanted to. So you can see here, this, this example has three different uh, directories. So the K8, S1 are the resources we're gonna put on our uh, cluster. And it also has a Docker file. So you can see in here how this is actually built. So there's instructions for setting this up into your own Docker account. It's already set up on mine, so I can just use it that way. But basically the process here is when you set up this uh, Docker image, is it's just going to rely on the uh, pre-existing image, which is this Microsoft SQL uh, Server Linux one. And so it's going to use that base image and then set up a, a directory and copy uh, the co contents of this app directory into it. It's, so within that app directories, there's this initDB uh, script. So it's going to just change the permissions of that okay. and expose a port. And then it's going to uh, also reference this entry point, which exists in here. So what the entry point does is it, it's going to reference that script and start the, the database server. So if we look at the init, basically what that does is it just runs a command to uh, you know, sleep for a minute, and then it's going to set up the connection information for the database so the password and stuff like that and also run this uh this other uh script file that we have here and basically all this does is, is it's going to generate a database called demo db uh create a table called orders and seed that table with two records okay so there's different ways to do this so we try to prevent or try to present different options here just to to learn here but so you could do this in code 
in any language that you wanted to, but <coughs> just, you know, I was thinking that this would be cool to see how you could do it this way if you wanted to. That's very nice. Okay, so we're gonna start setting this up. So as I mentioned, all these steps you, you can find in the readmes, but as I said, we'll have a tutorial that should be made available pretty soon that will walk you through with a little more detail than the, these uh, readmes have. Okay. So let's and start. always have a little bit of validation to them as well. So you know you're on the right path. Yep. So we already, what we wanna do is we haven't created a, a namespace dev yet. So I'm gonna create that and I don't, I don't have to worry about that, uh, the Docker steps. I'm just gonna apply this into my cluster. So the first thing I'm gonna do is set up a persistent volume plan. So basically what that is, is like a, a storage location to save, uh, in this case, the database contents to. Mm -hmm. So in the case that your pod restarts or something like that, it already has a persistent layer of information which it can then reattach to. So in the case of, if you weren't using a persistent volume claim, if you restarted your pod, you would your data would just be in memory and mm -hmm. it, it would do so, right? Yeah, your pods so would recover, but your data would be gone. Exactly. So the next piece is, uh, take a look at that. It's a pretty simple YAML file to uh, declare that. And then we have a secret. The secret is just used to set the user and password of the database. Okay. So you can see these are the, the values and these are the base 64 encoded values. So just for your reference, so I'm gonna uh, apply that. And then finally we have the deployment of the database. So, you know, there's just some, you mentioned like labels for uh, using logs and stuff. So you see different labels, things reference each other with labels too. So you see here the, the deployment of the database and we also deploy a service and it uses uh, the label uh, app MS SQL as a selector to what deployment that it's referring to. So the selector matches the, the labels defined in here. And then we have the container information and what port we're exposing and we'll see some uh, environment variables set up a reference to the the secret that we are using for the password and a reference to uh, the persist, uh, persistent volume claim that we're gonna store our database on. Okay. So let me see, so I didn't copy that. So I'm just gonna copy this and apply it. So now I could look at these, this information here if I wanted to, or if I want to come back to my uh, uh, Kima console. So I, I'm in my mocks right now. So I have this dev space now. And you can see that this is uh, waiting. So it's in process of doing something. Uh, we have a secret that we generated. So you see the MS SQL, uh, MS SQL. And you can see information about those two encoded values. Okay. You decode them by putting them into a base 64 decoder. Uh, we also created a service for it. So here's the service and, and the pod. So that's basically what it's going to do is, to, you know, just download that image and then it will eventually apply it in here. It needs a persistent volume claim to be existing too. So might see some stuff. So this is the Istio logs. So their Istio is set up. And then it's going to go through the, 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 the database itself and set that up. Okay. So we can look at the deployment. So it's still showing that that's an error. Um, you could just edit that file if you had some uh, misconfiguration in here. But this will take a, a moment or so to set up. So uh, here we can see now that the status is running. So if I click on the logs here, uh, so it's still in process because I, I know what it's going to say when it's ready. So it's still <laughs> setting this up. So you can see just various information. So it's looking at the temp DB. We're going to see a log that shows us uh, that it's generating that the that script is running and it generates that demo DB and sets up that uh, table with the two records into it. Okay. So we, we can let that proceed. 
and we'll go on to uh, step two, which I'll just pull this over real quick, where we're going to deploy our, uh, the API to actually communicate to this uh, database. Okay. So we're going to find that in, there's two of these in here. I'm going to use the go one. So there's actually a, a Lambda function if you wanted to use that as well. Uh, so, but I'm going to use this uh, go one. So let me just change my directory down here. I'll close this. And same thing, you're going to have a readme that shows information, just gives you details about it, how to use it, how to uh, run it with locally and stuff like that. So, and we're going to have a similar setup where we have this KAS directory with our resources that we're going to apply to our cluster. Okay. And we're going to have this Docker uh, file as well. And then we're going to have stuff related to the actual Go code itself. So we have a main, which is our, like our main entry point of our application. And basically it's just an API. So it's just going to set up some uh, paths and everything. It's just orders. And you'll find most of the code in this uh, internal folder. And there's going to be a DB for setting up uh, the connection to the DB. And then there's stuff about an order. So it's just uh, the different functions that get ran. There's a configuration for setting up uh, the different uh, variables that need to be existing for this to work. And then there's just uh, some information for the server API. And there's also, a, as I mentioned in the PowerPoint, there's a, uh, a consumer of events here. So with that, so I can, I'll go back to this readme. And so this I'll show you running it locally. So the first, so I mentioned there's uh, the user's environment variable. So the first thing we have to do if we wanted to use it locally is to set these. So I can just copy all of them and set them. So now they're existing down in my command line as a, a variable. And I can, I can run this here, but yeah, this isn't probably going to work, right? Because, you know, there's, I don't have the database. So you can see here, it's looking for a database on server uh, localhost. Local so if I just come and call localhost 8000 slash orders, I'm not going to get anything. I'm going to see that this fails and quits because it can't <laughs> connect to the database. So what I can do is there's this uh, port forward feature that's available in Kubernetes. So what I can do is type, uh, actually I need to know what the pod is named. So I can just do get pods in my dev namespace. And here's my pod. So I can do it port forward. So you're building a local proxy through Kubernetes on your machine. Yes. And I know the port that this is running on, it's always 1433. So you got to specify that. So what port you want to call and what do you want it to expose uh, locally for you? Okay. So that will set that up. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to set up another command line. So to run, my application, so I have to change into my Go API, and you know, I can just copy this line again, paste that, and I forgot to set my variables variables on this <laughs> uh, instance. So let me do that, and there we go. Look at it, the web page already refreshed. Huh. So you can see here that I have orders. If I call slash orders, you can see it. Now, if I go back and kill that and try to refresh this again, it doesn't work anymore. So it's okay. a nice feature for doing uh, local development, to be able yeah. to reference, uh, reference resources on your cluster locally. 
and that already reset, I can just close this guy out. So I didn't mean to close it out all the way. So let me, uh, I have to reset my cube config. That should be that one. Yep. Okay, so I'm back in, uh, back in order. So I showed you how to run it locally. So now we're gonna just set it up on our cluster. So you know, we have some instructions for using Docker, but I'm gonna deploy it. So in here we have uh, like a couple different resources. This one has two different examples. So you see there's a service binding one. That's if you're gonna use the uh, open service broker into Azure to provision a, a database, you wanna reference that. Okay. Uh, we're not doing that right now. <laughs> so, what we're going to do is uh, apply this config map. So the one thing to point out in here is if you don't use the dev namespace, that this host value would be different. So this host value is the value of the service of the database existing on, uh, on our cluster. So let me close this and show you. So you'll see here, Microsoft or MS SQL dot dev. And same thing here, and this is just the rest of the reference to reference it within the close uh, in the cluster. Yep, because so, we didn't run a productive database outside of our cluster. Yeah, or but if you know if you put the database in a different namespace, you got to have you're going to have to change that value. Okay. So just uh, just to point that out, and so let's see. So I'm going to apply the config map. I changed my path. I forgot to do that. Apply the config map, and then I don't need a secret because this this secret is the same as the other one. So it's just layer as a reference. I don't actually need it because I already have that existing. Uh, so I can skip that. I'm going to put the deployment and then the API role. And here you can see that this gives you some uh, commands you can use. So I can look at the deployment to check the status. And you can see that that's available. And so if I go here now, so see now I have another service. I have a, another pod that's, that's running. So I could look at the logs to see what it's doing. So you can see that it's already connected to the, the database. And I also have a API rule, which is going to expose that so I can use it externally outside. And I should mention here too, that this is looking as for the path orders. So you can see here when I go directly to it, it fails because that's not a valid path. If I put orders, I then get the orders back, right? And I can do the same thing, specify that order. I can po post to it and delete which you know, which we'll get into on the next step. Hmm. Okay. So we have our, let's go review again what we're doing. So we did our database, we have a Golang API. So now we're gonna put a front end on there to, to you know, expose this through the browser in a, a nice fashion, right? Yeah, and yeah. We're gonna use a UI5 application, uh, which is, if we're gonna find that, in the front end, so you can see here we have a React one too. It's basically the same exact app. So I'm going to switch into that folder, and let me close this. And we're going to look at what's in here. So different app, different kind of structure with the app itself. But you're going to find once again a Docker file and a KH file with the different resources. And then the rest of the stuff is really related to the app itself. And you also find your, uh, your readme file. So we have all these files in here. I can, I'm just copy one at a time. So one thing to notice in this one is I'll just apply it and show you different ways to, to do different things. So I created this config map, but this config map is not valid in, in this case right now. Okay. So it doesn't have a cluster domain. So in the case that you just applied everything, I'll show you what happens. 
So I'll put the deployment and the API role. So the deployment, same thing, just the deploys the, the image and also exposes it with a service. So this, you know, the service is the internal exposure of the application. And then we use the API role for the ex external exposure of the application. All right. So if I click on API rules, you're going to see now I have another one. I'm going to have a couple of another pod in here. You can see that that's starting. Once again, I can look at the logs. I could look at the logs in the command line. I can also have a view in here, like a global view of my uh, logs. So I could look at the, the stuff going on in here as well. And there's different ways to filter out and I can search in there and you know, it's set to auto refresh in last 15 minutes. So different, just different ways of looking at it, the information, but I see I'm going to come back and if I go to the API rule, this app should be ready. And if I inspect this, you're going to see that value for my uh, cluster domain is not filled out, right? Yeah. I never set that. So obviously it's not going to work because it doesn't know how to reference the, uh, the API. So I can look at stuff like the config maps on here and the dev namespace. And I think I need to put get. And I have this, uh, the UI5 one, so I could get this one and I could output it here to look at it if I just want to look at what it's uh, containing. This shows me, look, I don't have that cluster domain set. Mm -hmm. So I can edit it in, in here. Uh, different ways to do stuff. So I could edit it in, in here if I want to. And you'll see that value. I could also go back into my cluster and the uh, console window of Kima again, and I could edit the value right here if I want to. Nice. Very nice. So basically you just need this value in here. And so I could set it right here. Update. So I don't want to apply this here. So just make sure that that took place. So now we see the value down here. Okay. And this isn't, I don't believe it's going to be correct now because it's overwriting a value. So you can see here, it's still referencing that. So what we need to do is to kill our pod. Hmm. So I can just delete it here. And so I'm deleting the pod and you'll see right away, it's going to start another pod. Okay. So that's kind of the idea with Kubernetes is that you set up deployments as the desired state of an application. And then Kubernetes is always going to try to, to satisfy that. Yeah. So this deployment is set to just have uh, a, a single pod with a, you know, just a one replica set set up and it's always going to do that. So in the case that there is a lot of load and it started to spawn up additional uh, pods, Yep, uh, that would happen. But then when the load came down, it would try to go back to our desired state. Yeah, you always want to run your 50% of capacity or whatever to yeah. make sure you don't overload your systems. So now if I refresh this, we should see now it's calling the Beautiful. API and showing that. And I can add, if I wanted to add a record, I'm just real simple. Set that up, I can edit this value. I could delete it. I'll delete this one. Okay. I'll refresh it. Refresh it. That's going to, how it's going to stay. If I hmm. delete my pod, it's going to, my data is on my persistent volume claim. So if I delete my pod, when it comes back up, it's going to reference that persistent data there. Yep. Yeah. And as I said, if we weren't using the persistent volume claim, it would, it would lose it and just be back at the original state. Okay. So no, no, I definitely see where we've gone through the first five steps and gone from having nothing set up to deploying the mocks all the way to a UI that's saving its state in a local database within the actual container of that cluster. Yep. 
So we went through, you know, we're done up to uh, step six. Uh, we started setting up the commerce mock. So now we're gonna walk through that uh, scenario and finish setting that up and set up our uh, event trigger, right? No, this is where all the event trigger people have joined. They joined late just to see this part, so. <laughs> a lot of times you do demos of events, you see them on a serverless function or Lambda, so I you know, figured we should do something different to show you how you do it on a, a microservice. Yep. Okay, so let's see where we're at here. So uh, connected this, and I believe you registered uh, the connection here, so let me go back. So you can see here, you know, we we did that process of connecting and registering. Yep, yep. And it registers all the events. And there's there's two, uh, one section for, I'm sorry, it registers all the APIs and you also have one event section here. So what I'm gonna do is to bind this application to my dev namespace. All right. So that's gonna make it available in that namespace. So if I come into that namespace in question here, I have the catalog and I'm gonna see this uh, mm. application show up here. So if I click on this, I'm gonna see the same thing, all the different uh, APIs and events. You can see the different, the types they are, open API, async API or OData. I just need the uh, events and when you, when you click on these, you can see that I see example payloads of these, which is pretty useful. You can see the same thing if I go back and just click on one of these random uh, APIs, you see the same thing about you know what the inputs of the API are and like a sample responses and stuff like that. So it's pretty useful when you're developing that you have all this stuff centrally uh, located for you to make your, it makes your life a little easier. No, it's awesome. So let me, so what I'm going to do here is just to provision an instance of my events. So it, it's just going to give me a default name. You can change the name, but I'm going to leave it as is. So that's going to provision and there, you know, it's running already. So many times when you see this, you see somebody create a function and uh, use that event trigger. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a, the, you know, basically it's all done. You know, I could show you real quick, you create a function and you have uh, the events down here and you, you see them all, you can just choose one and then that connects this, uh, the function into it. And if you, the, the data of the event comes through event.data. Okay. I'm not, I'm not gonna do this now. So I'm gonna delete that. Instead, I'm gonna go back to, uh, let me see, so I'm gonna close this stuff. So we wanna go back to our API. So you'll see in here, we have an event trigger. So this is how we connect our API or microservice to the events. Okay. And so there's a, in the uh, API uh, itself, there's a, a path for event order I'm sorry, order code event. So you see that we're referencing a service called API MS SQL Go, and we wanna use this path. So basically when an event comes in, it's gonna send it here on this service. Okay. And what we're looking for is an order create it event. And so this is only set up to work with that event, but it, you know, if you use Commerce Cloud, it would, it would work as well. So the, the real, thing in question here is the source. So this is the name of the application or system. And you can see here, this is not, not correct. So this is not gonna work the way it is. Mm, yeah. So what we wanna do is edit that. And so that's gonna, sorry. That's gonna represent uh, this name. So if I just copy that value and replace this with that, save it. And I'm gonna change my path because I'm not in the right one. And I'll go back to the readme so that there's a step, there's 
steps in here. Let me see where it's at. So here, the event trigger. Got it. So it just gives you some information. So it's when I click the order created event, it's going to uh, consume that. So I'm just going to apply that into my namespace. And you see here, it creates the trigger. And now, so I have this all set up. And still have this app, app pop. So now if I come back to my mock application, I'm going to choose this uh, remote APIs. And I'll find events in here. Okay. Choose that. I'm going to take a sip of water real quick. And you'll see the kind of similar thing where we have all these different events. I'm going to choose the order code and I'm just going to set, you know, it, any number you want. And I'm going to submit it. Looks like it went through successfully. So what that's going to do is go into the event hub and then it should be basically trigger my API to consume that. So if I look, I believe I output something. So I can look at the logs. Yeah, there's a code. And you see the number there. It can or order number, yeah. shows you what the actual SQL that I run. And now if I refresh this, you can see here's my order one, two, three, one, two, three. And it, I just nice. insert the description order received from event. Okay. Pretty cool, right? Very cool. No, no, it's it's now it's getting closer to the edge where you're actually thinking of other systems and, and web pages and people doing e-commerce and sending stuff over through Kubernetes on Kima to a backend yep. data system. Yeah, so just to uh, recap uh, what we did here. Yeah, make this big. So we deployed our map mock application then connected it to the central management plane and paired those... Uh, yeah, so we paired the, the, the two systems together. You know, I know this is a mock application, so it's just, as I said, we're going to use it just so it's uh, available to anybody. Same would hold true if you're using uh, Commerce Cloud or any system that you want to connect into here. The process is the same. And then once we had that all set up, we deployed our database in our cluster. And as I mentioned before, that I would consider this like a development setup. If you want to do a production, I would externalize the database to a, a provider. And, you know, in this case, we would use uh, Azure for because we're using a SQL, uh, Microsoft SQL. But if you want to use HANA, you're going to use SAP or, or whatever. Okay. And so, so we have the database in a the cluster. Then we deployed our Golang API to expose the data and then use our uh, UI5 app. To, to actually visualize our data and then mm -hmm. uh, configured the, the GoLang app to consume an event from our, our mock application. Perfect. And uh, with that, we're, I think we're, we covered what we wanted to do. So yeah, for sure. Now, this is a great, great setup and a great uh, overview of the power of existing systems being used on new technology. Yep. And as I mentioned, this is going to be uh, published as a tutorial set or a mission inside of uh, the SAP Community uh, Tutorial Navigator. Should, so that should be there pretty soon. And you know, currently you can look at uh, the GitHub repository for all the different samples. So I use three samples within there. So it's all published in there as well. And there's additional ones in there. So just to give you, a, you know, be able to explore different, uh, not only different samples, but different uh, languages that you can program in. So you'll see stuff in JavaScript and like using Node.js or, or front end, such as uh, UI5 or React. We have uh, stuff relating to Java samples. We have the Golang API sample, uh, Lambda functions. So just a bunch of various different stuff to, to really get your feet wet when you're using this runtime. Perfect. All right. Well, anybody who has questions, of course, they can ask them uh, where these are airing and the YouTube channel for the SAP devs. 
and also on the GitHub repository for uh, Devtoberfest. We've had a lot of people opening issues and asking questions, and the stuff isn't going away. Just like your tutorial is going to be published, we're going to have blog posts coming and more things coming out as we get closer to TechEd. So there's going to be a lot of conversations where people can follow up and ask questions on how to actually play with this technology on their own. So yep. uh, anything else, any closing words? Uh, as I said, we got that, you know, we're going to post these links in the description. And if you have uh, certain questions, we have, there's a Slack channel nice. for the Kima open source. We have that communication channel. If you have questions and are, you know, any ideas with samples, put them as an issue into the, the sample re uh, repository. So you can contribute there as well if you, if you like, or if you just have questions, feel free to put something in there. Uh, and you know, so we have a, and we also have the SAP community where you can uh, ask questions. Perfect. All right. Well, I can't thank you enough. Uh, it went really fast. So uh, a very good session. Thank you so much for your time and thank you thank all you for, for watching. You're welcome. And uh, we will talk to you guys later. See you in TechEd. Bye. Bye-bye.